Hey everybody, this is Dr. Cheng Ron. Uh, we are at Houston, Texas in the Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. We talked about the gut-brain connection today, but I have a very special guest, uh, Andrew Salisbury, who is the CEO of Purity Coffee. And we're gonna talk about coffee today. And we're gonna talk about coffee in a way that's probably never been really talked about before, because we know people enjoy coffee, uh, but uh, there are so many different health aspects of it that can either, either make or break the coffee. So we're gonna get into a little bit of that. And so, you know, so let, let's talk about purity for a second. How, how did this company start? It's actually sort of a weird story. I mean, my, my background is not in coffee, um, but about four years ago, my wife was starting to get some health issues and similar to a lot of your patients, low energy and just she was self-medicating as a lot of us do by drinking a lot of coffee. Yeah. And so at the time I was a tea drinker and I actually thought that she was doing something that was bad for her, that she was putting one foot on the accelerator, one foot on the brake and she, she you know, potentially she wasn't doing herself any favors. Right. So I started to look into the health benefits of coffee and I was just blown away about just how good it was for you and what the scientific community knows about the health benefits but really what's lacking in the general public right and so and that you just birthed the company out of that concept it's, it almost it, it was a very iterative process the first step was I met two professors at uh, the Institute of Coffee Studies in Vanderbilt um, they told me about all the health benefits of coffee and then they introduced me to one of the leading coffee scientists in the world in Brazil I spent a lot of time in Brazil and we started working for about 18 months looking at every step of the production of coffee to see if we would do anything differently if we only had one criteria in mind and that is the health benefit of coffee. Great and so yeah. we, we know just by looking at different studies and what's analyzed in a lot of coffees today that there's different toxins that contain within them, right? And that may have to do with manufacturer process packaging and stuff like that, right? And so uh, even though there's health benefits of coffee, there's some negative connotations towards coffee that I kind of want to address as well, mm -hmm. okay? And so the first thing I really want to address is what's coffee supposed to taste like? Yeah, I mean, that's a, <laughs> it's a, that's a great question. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, what the, the, the problem is this, um, coffee companies have, have a challenge, which is that they want their coffee to taste the same in Singapore as it does in Seattle. Oh, okay. So what happens is that they roast their coffee to a level where you're tasting a burnt coffee. So in particular in America, you're used to burnt tasting coffee because that's the best way to create a uniform flavor. Mm. What coffee really should taste like, I mean, it's a whole wide range of tastes and chocolates and nuts. And it's just, you know, it's a fantastic, a fantastic drink if you drink good high quality coffee, but unfortunately most people um, are not getting good high quality coffee. They're getting coffee that's over roasted. Wow, so I think for me personally, uh, all I've tasted is probably burnt coffee mm. <laughs> yeah. up until very recently. And so uh, when I, we met in New York, I, I tasted the coffee. I was like, like this, is there some like fruit infusion into mm. this coffee? Is mm. there something that you're like, no, it's just coffee. Yeah. And I'm like, well, maybe this is what coffee is supposed to taste like. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I think when people think coffee, the, there's there's certain negative connotation to it. Yeah. Uh, one of them is that, okay, I've been tr drinking coffee and I stop, I get, I get this migraine or a headache and uh, it doesn't feel very good. Um, so is real coffee really supposed to do that if it doesn't have a lot of toxins in it? I mean, I can only say anecdotally, I can only say the people who drink purity when they stop drinking purity don't seem to have that type of caffeine hangover yeah. and withdrawal symptoms. So again, it's all a guess, but I think it's a result of the fact that most people are drinking coffee that has pesticides, mold, um, mm -hmm. they're drinking stale coffee and they're drinking coffee that's over roasted. So I think it's, you know, it could be an effect of a lot of those things as well. Right, that's, that's my hypothesis as well, because whenever people drink coffee, when they're getting other toxins within them, those toxins affect the body pretty instantaneously. And uh, those withdrawal headaches may be a shift in neurotransmitter balance okay. right after they injected something that may be toxic for their gut. And there's a huge gut-brain connection where the, most of the neurotransmitters that are created for the brain comes from the gut. And, then, um, and so what we do see in clinical research is that there's specific toxins, there's mold toxins specifically, mm -hmm. uh, which also exist in coffee, that can inhibit certain neurotransmitters, so serotonin and melatonin and whatnot. And then the, the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate starts being very hyperactive 
And that's where, you know, the headaches comes in. It's very similar to uh, people eating MSG, for example, mm -hmm. monosodium glutamate. It's a very similar type of the deal. But, you know, what you, what you said was, uh, was very interesting. So people who drink purity coffee or high-grade coffees don't necessarily have that withdrawal. And that makes sense because I'm a big green tea drinker mm -hmm. and I never get any withdrawal from green tea, but I have gotten withdrawal from coffee in the past uh, yeah. up until recently when I switched. And so, um, and so what toxins are found in a lot of different brands of coffee? Well, there's two sorts of ways that you get toxins in coffee. One is in poor production pack practices in the farm and the way that the coffee is produced. And the other is in the roasting of the coffee. So this is a long question, but if I can give you just sort of a snapshot. The first is um, coffee is the most heavily treated uh, crop on the planet next to wow. tobacco. Wow. So um, it's, and it's treated in countries that don't have the same level of oversight as you would in the US. And there's no checks and, <clears throat> excuse me, no checks and balances when that coffee comes to, uh, to the US. So the first thing is pesticides in coffee. That really is, as far as I'm concerned, the big issue. The second thing is that there's mold that's developing in coffee. And that's done for a variety of reasons and at different stages of the coffee production. Everything from the way that the coffee is picked, when they pick overripe berries along with the green berries and the red berries, they're putting them all into a process exactly the same time. They basically take a tractor and take it through the coffee trees and rake all the berries. And so what you get is when you get an overripe berry, it's like putting a, a moldy strawberry in a vat of fresh strawberries. Yeah. It creates yeah. Yeah, mold. Um, and then the toxins that, that, that we need to look out for is um, in the early stages of roasting, acrylamide is created. And in the later stages of roasting, there's polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are also a negative compound. Um, and then finally, I would say people are sensitive to the fact that they're drinking stale coffee. If you're drinking coffee that's been roasted 15 to 20 days ago, you're drinking fresh coffee. But the majority of people are drinking coffee that was roasted four months, five months ago, mm. and you're drinking, you know, there's rancid oils on the coffee beans. So that effectively, you know, creates some toxins. And so that affects the taste of it mm -hmm. as well, right? And yeah. so maybe I've been tasting rancid coffee for a long yeah. time yeah. Uh, until it's stumbled upon, upon purity. And so um, the, the mold that, that develops in coffee bean, that's something I see personally, because we do use coffee grounds for fertilizer. Yep. It takes like 30 minutes for, for mold to just grow over that. And that probably because there's a lot of surface area, there's moisture that's there. And it's, it's amazing how fast mold grows on that. It is. And so, and so you know, obviously that can't be good for you. So, you know, whenever, whenever we, we buy coffee, and, and when I got that bag of, of purity from, from New York and I took it back with me, there's, there's a valve that's on there, mm -hmm. right? Can you explain what that valve is? So when you get fresh coffee, yeah. it degasses. And so basically there's an off gas of the coffee, a healthy off gas. Um, and and what's, what's happening, if you had a closed bag, you would find that bag would expand and expand and explode but you really want fresh coffee. So some people, some coffee companies, just make sure that the coffee isn't fresh so they don't deal with the problem of the bag exploding. So fresh coffee off gases? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, carbon dioxide, and it basically, it, okay. it, 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 it off gases, but that's part of the process once you've roasted coffee. So we nitrogen flush our bags, which means that the coffee stays fresh in the bag. We want to create a valve so that the, um, the, the, the gases come out of the coffee the natural gases, um, but we don't let air in, which oxidizes the coffee. Okay, so the, the purpose of the nitrogen is to displace the oxygen so it doesn't mm -hmm. oxidize. That's right. And that goes into the bag, and that's why you have that valve that's right there. That's right. Right. Yep. And so, and uh, and how effective is that, is that valve? Is that is like a sure thing? It's very effective in the quality of the bags. There's um, there's certain grades of bags that you can use when you're buying coffee, and we okay. only pick the best with the highest oxygen barrier, so that it creates it. If if oxygen gets in the bag, then you're right. losing all of the benefit of every step of the process because you're losing about 25% of the antioxidants when the coffee stales. And we put all our focus or a lot of our focus in not just avoiding the impurities, but also increasing or maintaining antioxidants in coffee. Okay, well that's true. Some I go into Starbucks and I see the these these coffee beans kind of out in the open air. Mm -hmm. Is that a bad thing then? It's only bad if you're drinking coffee for health. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Good point. 
And so I, I do, I mean, we see, we see these coffee beans exposed to the air and there's light coming in. And of course there's no nitrogen that's, that's in that, that's yeah. in that vacuum or it's probably not a vacuum actually. Yeah. And then, um, you know, every time you order and they start the ground, they start the espresso and everything like that. And so, you know, the storage of that coffee can increase the chance that it becomes rancid. Right, oxidized. And if you go to a specialty roaster and yeah. you see a uh, you know a large amount of coffee that's out in the open, there's nothing wrong with that because it's just been roasted, okay. and that'll be fresh for the next fifteen to twenty days. And okay. you get a pound of that coffee, there's nothing wrong with it. The problem is when you go to uh, one of these larger chains, it's probably been roasted four or five months ago. Okay. Um, it just doesn't have that same sort of. They, they couldn't possibly have the supply chain that a small, specially roaster has. Okay, so yeah. let's say if I buy purity coffee and I open the, open the bag, right? And the, you know, I do fresh grounds and French press, yep. right? And so, um, do I just seal up the bag? Do I put it in the freezer? What do I do? What do I do? How do I store it? And it depends how much coffee you're going to go through. We we sell twelve ounce bags. For me, that doesn't last longer than a few days or mm -hmm. a week. Um, but if you if you really want to store coffee for a long while, the best way is to um, take out the oxygen, one of those sort of food saver bags, and put it oh, in okay. the freezer. Okay. Um, it, and that's the best long term storage because you want to remove the oxygen and you want to freeze it rather than put it in the fridge where you've actually got moisture and uh, and you're actually you know. Okay. Causing a bad effect to the coffee. So freezer, not fridge, and for sure freezer and not on the open somewhere. Yeah, and, and you want one of these bags that are vacuum packed bags. You know how, how you can do these the machines right. that pull out the the air. Yeah. So if the coffee beans are roasted earlier enough. Mm -hmm. then even if you put in the vacuum, are they still off-gassing in there or it's, no? It's normally about a 24-48 uh, hour process, but because we roast the coffee the moment somebody places an order, oh. we ship it the very next day, okay. we want you to have the freshest coffee. So we need to create, you know, have the valve and the nitrogen flushing so that the coffee is fresh and gets to you quickly. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a passion project to, to make sure all that's maintained, right? It, yeah. it really was. We, we decided to have a completely new approach to this. We looked at every step of the produ production chain and said, we don't care what it costs and we don't care really what the end result is in taste. We're only going to be driven by health and we're going to make every decision based on quality and health. And so we did a lot of things differently than no other coffee company does. Um, so yeah. In the, uh, in the pursuit for um, having coffee beneficial for health, it just turns out it's, it's, it tastes pretty good, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, we're lucky that coffee is more like to, uh, eating an organic strawberry that just tastes fantastic okay. rather than wheatgrass. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it happens to be when you get a high quality organic coffee that's roasted in the right way and is fresh, it's a fantastic tasting coffee. Although we didn't intend that to be our primary driver. This was really an experiment to see what would happen if every decision was made on based on health. Okay, and we met at an integrative health conference. Yep. And so, you know, obviously that's, that's where you are and not some other places. Yeah. And um, the discussion behind Purity Coffee has kind of exploded really in the last couple of months, really amongst my peers as well. Yeah. And looking at, uh, and we, we always have a distrust when it comes to coffee in my, in my profession. Yeah. Um, just because we don't know what our patients are getting. And so, you know, when we put them through certain uh, diets or certain protocols, we're so, they ask us, oh, do I have to get rid of my coffee? Mm -hmm. And up until recently, I was very hesitant to say, no, you can continue it. But, you know, now we're, we're more like, okay, well, grab some purity on the way out right. <laughs> of the office. You can have that one. And uh, they actually taste in the office and, and they, they love it. Fantastic. Uh, the I remember the first day that we put purity cow in the office for free and people started tasting it. Um, they were in the waiting room, okay? Mm -hmm. And when they got there, they didn't feel so great. And then when they got to the office, like, that coffee was good and I feel a whole lot better. <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. what happened during that time is, is these antioxidants, the polyphenols and all these great things in the coffee allowed some neurotransmitter magic to happen where they're activating that serotonin and they come in just much happier and they just relax and they're just crossing the legs, just sipping on the coffee and we're discussing their health. Yeah. And so that's that's now like a norm in my office, uh, which is great. But it's not something I would expect for people to drink coffee 
and have that sort of, hey, nice, relaxed atmosphere. Yeah. Because you hear, you know, you drink coffee, you get like real jittery and stuff like that, right? So speaking of jittery, do you get jittery when you drink coffee or is that a thing? Not at all. And I think that's that's the the the, the biggest feedback that we've got from our customers and, you know, 1,500 five-star testimonials in just the last few months mm -hmm. all talk about the fact that not only do they like the taste of the coffee, but they feel differently because of it. And that's the number one positive feedback we get is, you know, no jitters, no acid reflux, no stomach problems with it. People who couldn't normally drink coffee previously now can drink Purity. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's really as a result of one of these bad things or a combination of these bad things that are in coffee that, um, you know, that, that cause that negative effect. Wow, so that's interesting. So, so I guess we're not supposed to feel jittery. We're not supposed to have this coffee headache, right? Yeah. And uh, and we may not even supposed to have acid reflux when I drink coffee because coffee did used to give me acid reflux. I don't have okay. it with with purity, and so and so you know speaking of acid reflux, a, lot, a big portion of acid reflux is that if there's environmental toxins or mold toxins that's contained within coffee, it causes a major inflammation that happens, and when that happens, you're you're the pylorus of the stomach, which is the the part of the stomach. Uh, towards the end of the stomach and squeezes and actually does cause acid reflux mm -hmm. back because it doesn't want you to keep going. And so I do think that's a mechanism that's uh, that's behind that. And not only that, um, it doesn't take a whole lot of digestive enzymes to digest something that's natural and doesn't have a whole lot of uh, a lot of toxins with it as well. Right. So that's that's my theory. I don't really know if it's true, but it's, this definitely makes sense from a physiologic standpoint. And so uh, let's talk about where do the beans come from? How do you choose? Well, that's a really interesting question. So one of the things that we care about the most is the antioxidants in coffee, the CGAs, chlorogenic acids in coffee. So coffee is the number one source of antioxidants in the American diet. And that's not because the American diet is bad, it's because coffee is so high in antioxidants and people drink it every single day. So coffee is the number one source of antioxidants in the standard American diet? That's right. That's fascinating. Yeah, I know, isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, but it's very rich in polyphenols. It's wow. like cacao, it's like chocolate. Yeah. It's very rich in polyphenols. And a lot of these spices that are higher in antioxidants, you're not gonna consume as much, but people never forget to take their coffee. And so it's a daily thing. So the first thing that we do is we want to find the coffee that's highest in antioxidants um, in a particular harvest. And the only way for us to do that is to lab test around 40 to 50 organic coffees and pick the ones that are highest. So we're not driven by a region. We're not driven by looking for a Brazilian coffee or a Honduran coffee or a Guatemalan coffee. We're driven by which coffee in this harvest is highest in antioxidants that's organic and is specialty grade coffee. And, and that's how we, we pick the coffee for that, for that season. Okay, so you're not really heavily invested in one region. No. Well, I guess that health driven, right? Yep. And you, you, just, you just pick. That's right. We, we, because the amount of antioxidants will vary from region to region and, and um, uh, season to season, and it's just not predictable. So one farm that has very high antioxidants this year yep. may not have high antioxidants next year. Oh, interesting. Okay. So we have to be driven not by the region. If we make every decision based on health, we have to be driven by which harvest, which crop has the highest antioxidants for that season. And the only way to do that is lab test all of these coffees, which of course no other coffee company does. Right. You know. So this reminds me of wine, mm -hmm. because in the wine industry, it's very similar, right? So there's different regions and different seasons, and those particular type of wines have the highest antioxidants, resveratrol and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. And so I never really thought of coffee that way. So I think my original idea behind coffee, okay, maybe these particular farms have the highest antioxidants, we'll just stick to these. Yep. But you're saying that can shift yep. from time to time. So that takes a lot of testing, right? A lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's uh, one big part of our initial expense starting up this business was just the 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 amount of testing we did because we just didn't have to test our coffees. We had to test forty nine of the top brands of coffee in the U S. to see whether we'd actually how do we compare with those because in a vacuum. It's just, it's, it, the information isn't valid. We had to see how we compared in antioxidants to every other coffee brand from specially grade all the way to the cheap um, Folgers, Mackerel House, that sort of thing. Gotcha, you just keep climbing, climbing, climbing. Let's see, yep. let's see what, yeah. what beans we have and do a comparison. Yeah. 
across the top brands. Yeah. As far as antioxidant, there's no coffee brand that's higher in antioxidant than us. And so we're competing against ourselves to sort of push that top right hand corner to get a better and better coffee. Um, and But it's that's that's fun. I mean, that's the real challenge. So I just feel like everyone should know about this then. <laughs> 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 Trying to get the word out there, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it's, um, and you know, in terms of like sustainable resources on the agricultural side, um, we always talk about vegetables and rotating crops and from different areas and stuff like that. So it sounds like it's the same thing for coffee as well. Yeah. It, it's funny, since we made every decision based on health, we didn't want to be driven by anything. While we care about the environment, we didn't want that to be the primary driver. But what we found out is that the coffee that is grown naturally, so um, one of the measurements in coffee is, is the coffee bird friendly? Is it uh, hand-picked, hand-selected? Um, the very best coffee, the highest in antioxidants, the least mold, is bird friendly, is hand-picked, hand-selected, it's, it's sustainable farming. And that's because the natural way of producing the coffee okay. keeps more of the antioxidants in the, in the coffee. What does bird friendly mean? So bird friendly, you would think, would have nothing to do with health, and it, it is yeah. what it sounds like. It means yeah. that the coffee doesn't kill the birds and kill wow. the birds by. <laughs> but what happens in, yeah. in plantations with coffee, you'll have just rows and rows of trees of coffee trees, and the reason they have them set up that way is because they want to take a big tractor going all the way through the trees when it's harvest time, and they pull out the underripe cherries, the overripe cherries, the green cherries, the ripe cherries and tree and twigs and all this sort of thing because so, they want to uh, save picking time. Okay. The problem is that's not an environment that a bird can live in. In a lot of these countries like sort of Brazil and Colombia, there's fantastic wildlife, but because they've created, they've cleared all this land and created just this sort of row farming, it's not bird friendly. But when the trees are planted in their natural habitat, they're friendly to the birds, birds, you know, just you know, have nests there and it's all, all very safe for the birds, that's the uh, coffee that is healthiest. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> you would think it would have no correlation. It's not directly linked to health, but we found that's a great marker for us to look for when we're looking for coffee. We know if it's bird friendly, it means right. that it's done in a way that's sustainable. So how many people are doing what you're doing in terms of looking at coffee like this? I don't think anybody yet. I mean, we're hoping more people get involved. I mean, my goal is that people will look at health as a criteria when they're buying coffee. Okay. Um, I think we have the benefit that we yeah. started with a clean sheet of paper yeah. and we just said we, we have no vested interest in any any sort of process um, and we wanted to look at every decision based on health and I don't okay. think anybody's gravitated there yet. So you're kind of like a coffee superhero then. I don't know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe coffee and health, but it's a very small environment. <laughs> it is a small environment, yeah. but you know, in, in, in what we do, yeah. especially using food as medicine, you yeah. know, this is a seriously important thing. Yeah. And then uh, it's also really sad to hear that the coffee maybe the, has the highest antioxidants in the standard American diet, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so I think, you know, what we want to do is really change the world. We want to change the way that we perceive food, whole foods and stuff like that. But coffee was definitely not at the top of my list before. Yeah. But it certainly is now. And I'll tell you what, you know, I stayed up late last night. I was finishing my PowerPoints mm. for, for the conference. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and I woke up and I'm like, what is the best decision for me right now? I know I need some caffeine. And mm. I was like, I can't do anything except purity because yeah. I know that by the time 3 p.m. hits, which is now, um, I would be pretty much on my, on my butt. Yeah. <laughs> And so um, with what purity and what I always experience is that it's, it's like a pick me up and it's, it's kind of like, it's like an adaptogen. It helps my body adapt to the situations, which is, which is fascinating. And number one, number two, um, the coffee that I drank this morning, I'm still tasting it in my mouth. Okay? okay. And that's true for a lot of different foods that activate neurotransmitters to make you feel good. The NMDA neuro, uh, and receptors. Yeah and uh, even opioid receptors. And so as I'm talking to you, we're talking about purity coffee, I can actually taste it, uh, which, is, which is a really good thing. And if you think about it, that is your brain recalling back something that is uh, very advantageous for you. It's also your body trying to tell you that that might have been a good thing that, that entered the body. So, yeah. and that's, that's, a, that's a physiologic state that people can be in. And it's really trying to remember things that, that, that are going back in time that's, that's really good for you. And so, 
I believe in a higher power. So whatever higher power is telling me to, to taste this right now, I'm tasting it as you're talking right. about, it, I'm tasting it as you're talking about how, how these, these beans are grown, the harvesting, and I'm imagining in my head and it gives me that sort of a, a, a nice uh, feedback into what this is. And so um, it, it makes me also very sad uh, that most coffees in America are not perceived this way. Yeah. Um, it also makes me very sad that when we look at coffee, um, there is such a huge negative connotation to it. But we know, we know based on a lot of different studies that co the coffee's benefits are, are there, right? Even if it's not purity brand, because purity didn't exist when Absolutely. those studies were done, right? Great. So we know that helps with memory, in increasing uh, the, the, the drivers of, of developing memory in the brain, the cyclic GMP and all those different processes. And we know that not only does it help with memory, it actually can possibly uh, uh, decrease the decline of brain streaking in different parts of the brain as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in, in what we do, what well, we want to grow back brain, we, that's, that's our thing, you yeah. know? And so um, in the process of talking about something like anti-aging, and the process of talking about so getting your antioxidants in, I think this goes uh, in line with that. And so um, how, how do you, because we've been talking for a while, how do you introduce this concept to people just in passing? Like, what do you say to them? I'm really curious. I mean, it's probably one of the challenges that we have in this company is that we, we don't want to be in Amazon. We don't want to be in Whole Foods. We want to make sure that the health message gets communicated. So we're doing that through doctors and nutritionalists who've got that story to tell. Um, but it isn't, uh, there isn't really an elevator pitch apart from coffee is really <laughs> good hard. for you. Yeah, yeah, and it can be made better. I mean, our argument is, you know, the taste will speak for itself. People will love the coffee, yes, but, yes. but I, I think people need to understand that it's more than that. And it's probably one yeah. of the best things that you can be drinking. And the other thing that's important, it's a very high leverage point. When you've got 164 million Americans who are gonna wake up this morning and drink coffee, that's something that everybody is doing. And if you could just even improve that behavior by 10%, it's gonna have a real impact on overall health. Uh, yeah, so. and overall health, decreasing their toxic load and you know, replacing with something that's, that's, that's fabulous. Okay. So um, my, my, my last question for you is that when I look at coffee in, in, in general, okay? Um, so I was born in China and I, and I grew up in China. We didn't have a whole lot of coffee. We had a bunch of tea, right? Yeah. And, so, and so when we, when we looked at tea, we see tea as like a spiritual cleansing. Yeah. We now know that there's certain ingredients in tea that are very detoxifying. They help with the brain and it's very similar, uh, similar data to what coffee can provide. In America, we don't see it that way. You know, I think a lot of physicians, most most physicians will say, you know, you might want to get off coffee. It's causing high blood pressure. It's causing your heart rate to go high and stuff like that. So we know based on clinical data that co that coffee itself, the ingredients that are coffee, there's no component that causes chronic high blood pressure. Yeah. Right. And uh, and <clears throat> there's no component in coffee that contributes to a specific chronic disease. But we do know that there's toxins within them that that do, and so how how do you communicate this to the general conventional medical community that hey I'm not just pushing coffee on you this is actually something that's a health benefit how do you say that to like physicians and the healthcare practitioners? Well, you made the point earlier. There's been a lot of studies done on coffee and health. I think around 19,000 studies done on coffee and health. It's probably one of the most studied foods on the planet. Yeah. And the, the information that's come out about coffee and health is it's very good for you. And that was before purity ever came along. So right. it's fantastic for the prevention of type 2 diabetes. There's a very large study, 1,109,000 people followed over 30 years that show um, four cups of coffee, three to four cups of coffee a day has a 45% lower chance of ever you ever developing type 2 diabetes. Right. Liver disease, 20% for every cup you drink. So, so in other words, coffee in general, the first point is, regardless of all the some of the negative things that could be done in coffee where it's not perfect, generally it's very good for you. So what we believe is coffee is very good for you and it can be made better. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. So yeah, I'm really glad to have this conversation. It really cleared me up on a lot of different things. And I have my own misconceptions about coffee. And uh, I think as we're discovering more and more, 
um, we can also put purity to the test. And that's kind of like what I do in my practice. You know, yep. it's uh, we, we, we see that patients do feel better on it if they do the switch and the patients don't get any headaches on it, withdrawal, reflux and everything that we know is doing well for them. And so, and uh, we want to get as much antioxidants into our patients mm -hmm. as possible. And then now, now the, the, the main thing is to letting my colleagues know <laughs> and letting the medical community know that there is some company, Purity, who's just as passionate about the medical side uh, as, as, as we are, but in the coffee arena, which has never happened before. So I thank you for taking right. on that challenge. It's a big challenge. No, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's been a great ride so far. It's, uh, it's so nice to see it's so well received. And, uh, and I think, you know, the time is right. Yeah. The studies have been there for a long time. People are now recognizing how good coffee is for them. And it's important that they know where to go, where they can trust that the coffee is, is every decision based on health. And it's, it's particularly good for them. Well, awesome. Thank you very much. So um, we're just going to end uh, on uh, the last note is that I'm probably going to be drinking coffee, purity tomorrow morning as well. Okay. <laughs> and uh, one of the, the, the great things about coffee, which I know we've been talking about the health aspect of it, is that um, we are now allowing it to become our culture in my home. Great. And so um, I don't know if you've seen my daughters on Instagram, uh, my five-year-old literally mm -hmm. doing a French press. I asked her what coffee it is. She's like, purity. <laughs> and so because that's been a big deal with me growing up in the tea side with, yeah. in, in China, because making tea and brewing tea was a very cultural thing that we enjoy doing together, but I'm really glad to adopt the coffee side into it. Here. We, we do the same thing, we call it a coffee huddle. So our morning <laughs> with my wife and my daughter before yeah. she goes off to school, she has a very small cup of coffee. Uh -huh. um, and my wife and I sit and we plan the day and it's, it's very sort of, it's very ritualistic. It's uh, no, sort of that's the awesome. same thing. Yeah. That's great, that's great. Well, thanks a lot for talking. Thanks. I thanks appreciate a lot. it, appreciate it. Thank, thanks a lot.